Hey Mike, do you remember we used to invite us to your house to see your tigers during yeah, Magic Show? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yo, this dude is crazy. He's like, don't worry about the cat. Don't worry about it. I used to be scared like fuck. Dude, you gotta and tell then, us. And then Mike is gonna be like, hold on, this is one thing. Don't turn your back on it. Yeah, he's yeah, gonna yeah, yeah. think you're running yeah, from it. He's like, when he tells us this, like, it was, it was obviously too late at that point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, another ep- um, epic episode. That's what this is an episode. That we have um very special, a very very special person here. You know, what I mean, we can call him anything. We can call him um the designer to the inner city. I love that. He came. He came down from. He came, When did you first start? Well, anyway, it's the one and only Carl Canal. The Carl, right? Check Carl Canal, baby. This is what I didn't. What, what was the first thing you ever made? You know, it's funny. Talked about this the other day. One of my first suits that I made, we sold to Simons yeah, in Brownsville, yeah, Brooklyn. Brownsville, yeah, that's my wow. style. I love that's, from Brownsville. That's yes. That. And do you remember that I saw you with Jackie at yeah, you that? Took a picture uh, of, me a picture of you with Jackie. He was the first celebrity I saw from the hood wearing my stuff that he bought at Simons. Wow. He had no idea it was me. I told Jackie, please introduce me to Mike. He got my clothes on. And she introduced me to him. And that was what one of the first guys that helped set it off and show the people on the streets who we were. Wow. This is back in 1990. That's so awesome. Damn, 1990 was forever, huh? Yeah, that's when it was real. But listen, that was that was just what it was. Um, and what made you think that? What did you say? That did you say? Um, we should make our own clothes for our own community. Well, how did this come about? Making clothes. Who was your first? Um, yeah. Well, basically. Before? You know, my family is from, I was born in Costa Rica. My dad's Panamanian. Mm-hmm. When I moved to the States, I was like three years old. And my dad used to get his clothes made by a tailor. So my dad used to go to Delancey Street, buy his fabric, and go back to Flatbush. He used to go back to Flatbush and have his Haitian tailor make his clothes for him. So I, I used to see the process of how you can make clothing without really knowing how to sew. So you know in the hood how it is, everybody respects you based upon what you're wearing. Yes. You know what I mean? If you come outside, your clothes is your clothes is whack, you're going to get dissed. Yeah. So I remember moving into the projects in East New York from Flatbush, and I went outside trying to meet all the kids. I was 12 years old. I'm excited. I'm thinking about to play in dirt. And everybody laugh. Ah, look at him. There's like, what kind of sneakers you got on, man? And then, man there's like, man, this shit just skips, man. Your mother bought those from the grocery store, man. Get the fuck out of here with them shit. So I went home crying to my mom. I was like, yo, mom, look, I need some money to buy some clothing. These kids are just making fun of my clothing. You know, my mother from the island, she's like, Pfft. Boy, you better go out there and find yourself a job. <laughs> Talking about clothes. You get one pair of sneakers for the year. You're good. So I refused to go back out there and hang out with them. I found me a newspaper route. I used to get up 5.30 in the morning and deliver newspapers so I could get money just to buy clothing. Mm. And that was my first take into realizing how important fashion was to the kids in the inner city. A big time. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Listen, um, yeah, it means a lot. It means everything. It means yeah. yeah. It means everything. Your, what your status, what you're wearing, that's your, that's, your, that's your vehicle. That's your car at the time. So what happened from there was me and all my friends used to out try to out shop each other and try to get the fresh clothing. Then when we found something fresh, we never told each other where we got it from, right? So I thought about my dad's tailor one day. I was like, damn, if I make an outfit with his tailor, none of these dudes will have it. Did you put pockets on your side and stuff? Yeah, like I did, that? yeah. You I, tailor made, we tailor made suits have pockets on the side. Yeah, like, yeah. So when I wore that outfit around the way, everybody, you know, back in the 90s, everybody was hustling. So there was a lot of money on the streets. Everybody had money. So when I wore that around, everybody was like, yo, where'd you get that from? Where'd you get it from? So I ain't, I ain't about to tell him about my tail. I was like, if you want one, I'll make you one. So literally, I started making clothing for all the hustlers and the projects. He used to give me wads of cash. I started making them outfits. And really, that's how streetwear really started. There's nobody could ever say they started streetwear before me because we didn't even know what we was doing. We was just hustling. We just took our street hustle and turned it into clothing. That's all it was. Mm. That's really fly. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, clothes is everything. Clothes is everything. So when did you make the move out to L.A.? Yeah, that's really important. What happened was a lot of my friends started getting locked up and killed in the projects from hustling. And Were I was, you in Vanderveer? I was in East New York. East oh, New York. Oh, Star oh, City. Star oh, City. Oh, right, across City yeah. from Lin- right across from Linden Projects. Yeah, I know. That's, that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah, right at the end, right, right by the uh, Belt Parkway. One day we were just sitting in the park. Was that the number two train out there? Back in the day? Yeah, it was number two, exactly. Number two train. Uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah, yeah number there you two go. Train. There you go. And, um, I was sitting in the park one day and these, this, this dude walked by, I had one of my outfits on and I was bragging to these girls saying I made that outfit for him. They said, like, no you didn't. I said, yes I did. They said, tell him come over. So dude comes over, his name was Joe. They says, who made that jacket for you? She, they was like, he's like, Carl made it, why, what's up? She's like, let me see your jacket. She's looking at the jacket, she's like, 
Yeah, with Carl made, how come his name ain't on it then? And that's when it hit me. I should start putting my name on the clothing. I wasn't putting any name on the clothing. Before. I was just making custom-made clothing with no name mm. on it. You know what I'm saying? So when she said that, I started thinking like, damn, I want to be like Ralph Lauren. I want to be like Tommy Hilfing. I want to be like yeah. Calvin Klein. So I went home and started coming up with a name. My family's last name was Williams at the time. My father changed it to an American last name. I was like, Carl Williams Jeans. Just didn't really have a good ring to it. Can I was a question he's asked myself all the time. Can I be uh. successful? Can I come from the streets and really build a brand that's going to be worldwide known? I didn't know the answer to that question, but I knew if I put that part of my name, I have to answer that question every day. Yes, I can. So that's how Carl Can I came about. And I moved to California in 89. My friend named AZ, from the project Who You Know. know well. AZ caught a case. He's supposed to do five years in jail. AZ skipped town and moved to Orange County, living with his brother in Orange County. So we lost contact. He hit my. He called me one day. He said, "Yo, Carl, what you doing?" I said, "I'm hustling these clothes out." He said, "You should come to L.A., man. Got this new rap group out here. It's hot." He sent me an Easy E CD in the, in the mail. Wow. A cassette in the mail, and I was like, "This shit is bumping." So AZ finds us a store on Crenshaw Boulevard, 4312 Crenshaw. We opened up shop right there, and that's really how it all started. June 23rd, oh, 1989. LA, huh? Yeah. We left New York, came out here, just so we could be more focused just on the business, no distractions. That's amazing, yeah. man. Yeah. Straight up. But you've, your company, you've been through some serious crises with your business and, and everything that has happened on your journey with that. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, because we started from the bottom, so we came what out here. With the other brother named Carl? Carl Jones from Cross yeah. yeah, we became partners. Yeah, we came out here, we only had $1,000 in a pocket full of dreams. But the key was we had that New York hustle. And that New York hustle, when you come from Brooklyn, man, you just got something about you. We Losing is not an option. So we came out here. We was hustling on Crenshaw. Some gangbangers came in our store and robbed us at gunpoint, took our sewing machine, all our samples. So we could, we had two choices at that point. We could either go back to New York with our tail in between our legs or we're going to find another way to hustle. So we ended up getting an apartment in Hollywood, start doing a mail order business out the apartment in Hollywood. One night, AZ was out to the clubs. He told me, yo, come outside, man. Come to the club. Cross Colors is having a fashion show. We got to meet this dude. We go out there. Cross Colors is another black-owned company. They have financing behind them. Yeah. And we met. And within 20 minutes, Carl Jones is like, yo, I heard about your stuff. If you want to come partners, I'll be willing to help you out. And my heart just started beeping really fast. Because you know where we from, Mike? Nobody just help you out no, just to help you out. Want something. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I'm always wondering, what is this dude about to steal all my shit? You know what I'm saying? So I went home and told my mom. She's like, you need to pray about this, see how you feel. And I just went for it. We became partners, became 50-50 partners. And in the first month together, we did like $4 million in sales off of one store. Wow. Then it was history ever since. The first year, we did like $89 million. This is back in 1990, us together. So tell me, what do you do to compete with um, the competition of clothes now? How do you become so... Um created to deal with the clothes of the 2000s. Yeah. I think you got to learn how to adjust with the moment, adjust with the time, and don't become one of those designers that's stuck on the past. Because you got to... What, what do you wear now? Yeah. I say to myself, what do I wear? I don't wear nothing. I wear the clothes I wore 20 years ago. Yeah. What's old is new. It's all coming back. Exactly. I wear the clothes I wore 20 years ago. The clothes I, the clothes I wear now, the clothes I wore when I was fighting. Right, really? I bought you something old school that you used to wear back in the days for you. Oh, oh shit! You got, you got, you got, you got pictures of me wearing that? Bro! Thank you, bro. The velour joint. Oh, oh my oh, god. god. The back. <laughs> oh, this is crazy. Oh, shit. Oh, Carl, can call? I get one of those? Absolutely. Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> oh, God, what am I do with this? Old dude, school. we've been calling it in. We're like, we got to get Mike a new tracksuit. Old school bro. vintage. Yeah. Old school. <laughs> we need it. Old school vintage right there. Oh, that's yeah, but dope. Listen, um, so you just asked me, how do we adjust today? Well, we do, yeah. we do unique collaborations. Like right now, we just did a collaboration with this company called Pretty Little Thing. It's a fast fashion women's company. They do about $600 million. The reason why they wanted to do a collaboration with us is Pretty Little Thing wanted to get validated on the streetwear market. And Carl and I, we wanted more of that crossover market with our brand. So we was able to combine two brands together, and we both got what we needed out the collaboration. So just doing unique marketing and very much social media. Like, you know, like back in the days, it was all about Source and Vibe magazine. That don't mean nothing no more. It's all about social media influences and you know things like that. That's what changes the game right now. Yeah. That's interesting. It's interesting how that's happening. Right? Yeah. Not, nobody does look at magazines. The magazines is your phone. Yeah. It's your iPhone yeah. now. You know, no yeah. one reads the magazines anymore. Yeah, absolutely right. It's all about influences. Yeah. And 
Anything you want to know, you man. put it in the phone and boom, I get the whole history of it. Yeah. Do you do you see um with the influencer marketing, do you see the returns of that you would see in the past with say tradi- some traditional marketing style? You know the funny thing about marketing? You gotta kinda have like a gambler's mentality in this business. You just gotta gotta put it out there and don't think about it. The minute, the minute you start thinking, you're gonna overthink. Like, should I do yeah. this? Should I? You know, you just gotta do it. And once your business is going, you just gotta keep going and going. Don't think. And once you start thinking, you may fuck around and stop because you're you fucking crazy. You look a lot of weight, you know, but from back in the day, man. Yeah. You know what I mean, you look, you transformed your whole body. I did. You know, me tell you why I did that. Why? Well, tell me. I hated the competition. Really? And I knew, I knew that this thing was gonna be. A marathon, not a sprint. Oh, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So I knew I, I, I had marathon. to I had to outlast them. You know what I'm saying? Marathon. I had to outlast them. Because I knew a lot of them didn't get in the game for the fucking guts of being designed. They did for the money. And I know with that, they're going to leave that alone because it's a tough business. You ain't going to like it when it goes Listen, down. Listen, when you say the word marathon, marathon is a war. That's right. Marathon or, um, originated from the war, the war marathon um, in Greece. Mm. You know what I mean? Fighting with the Persians and stuff. Mm. And that's the guy he did. He ran 26 and a half miles from there and had a heart attack. He delivered the message and dropped dead of a heart attack. <laughs> and so ever since then, they made that marathon. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. yeah. From the war marathon. Wow. So after that last time, Mike. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. Yes, in my life, I used to have some, listen, I used to have problems um, when I was going crazy and all that shit back in, uh, back in the 90s and 96, 97. What was happening in my life it was just I had to outlast people. People in certain agencies, certain television companies, the uh, paper, they wouldn't deal with me. Certain people from certain um, soda companies, the TV company wouldn't deal with me. And I just had the people just started dying and like my life started changing. You know what I mean? But you gotta wait them out. And while you're waiting them out, you're suffering. Hey, Mike. Do you remember you used to invite us to your house to see your tigers during yeah, Magic Show? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yo, this dude is crazy. He's like, don't worry about the cat. Don't worry about it. I used to be scared like fuck. Dude, you gotta then, tell and then, us. And then Mike is gonna be like, hold on. This is one thing. Don't turn your back on it. Yeah, you can't I, yeah, take it yeah. I think you're running yeah, from it. He's like, when he tells us this, like, it was, it was actually too late at that point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, oh, I remember Mike used to come good. out of the booth. Mike was like, hey, man, I want you guys to come over to my house for dinner. He was like, Mike, we're going to come. He said, hey, make sure you guys come. I'm getting dinner prepared for you. To I was like, Mike, we're coming, man. We're coming. He used, to, he used to invite the whole crew into his crib. It was cool, man. I love that. It was cool. Where were the Tigers kept? In his garage. Oh, my God. They were God. in his garage. <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. Is that where you kept, you kept them yeah. in your garage, right? Yeah. 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 Oh my god. That was crazy. Two of them, or just I think one? Two of them. Yeah, and you had more than one. That's for yeah. sure. Oh my god. That. Carl, so that first time you went and met Mike, yeah. you got introduced to Mike. Uh-huh. How did that? that how basketball was that? Game, Is it right? a bas- that's the one some people that died at. Remember yeah. the people got trampled in yeah. a staircase. Oh, yeah, it was god. crowded. Uh, I think Diddy and uh, Heavy D was doing a big no, event. Who was it? Was Puffy and Heavy D? Heavy D, yeah, they were doing a big event there. Yeah. Um, what was your question? How- when you guys first met, yeah, what was that like? Man, it was that was Brooklyn right there, man. Yeah, that was Mike Tyson. I mean, I used to think about Mike. Mike has inspired me. I used to like think about him on the treadmill. Mm-hmm. Just think about his grind, like how he used to do it. You know, what yeah. I'm saying it just helped me in the clothing business, and that's what really inspired me. Him. And just certain rap records, you know, you just think about things. That's what I used to do rap records. Yeah, listen rap records yeah. all the time. Yeah, motivate King you. King of Rock, they ain't nothing higher. Fuck them, she's gonna call me thigh. I used mean, to fucking. I'm Dope. talking about, but over and over, like a billion times in my fucking head, playing it over. Yeah, yeah. We had, yeah. had the tape thing. You had to wait to hit, wait to rewind, then yeah. play. That's that Brooklyn shit, man. It's like yeah, where we. It's just hard to explain. When you come up from there, you just experience so many things at such a young age. It just becomes a yeah. part of who you are. It's so, all about proving something. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. It's all about proving something. Even when we went shopping, it was one thing we get the money to go shopping. Guess what the problem was? We have to worry about not getting robbed, yeah. coming back home with the clothes. Yeah. That was the drama. Because the, 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 the robbers are waiting right in front of the store. I'm saying, hang out, smoking, chilling right in front of the store. Yo, who's that? Oh, that's some boy. Sco- no, nah, I don't know this name. Get him. Yeah. Get him. You know, and that's what we dealt with on a daily basis. Yeah, we too. All those, um, what were those guys called? What were those the shower posse? Yeah. Another, um, <laughs> Who tut, you, tutting them? Yeah, you got to yeah. worry about dumb guys. But we only had to worry about those guys in Vanderveer and stuff. You know, we all knew um, Glaze and Tut and all those guys. Yeah, yeah. 
I go and see Tut every now. Oh really? How's he yeah. doing? Tut is good. Tut yeah. Is good. That's crazy. How about Lou? Lou is beautiful too. He called me yesterday. Lou, Lou is my man. That was a good crazy. dude, man. Great. I love that. That was a good dude right there. Lou still live in Brooklyn? Yeah, he told me to tell you hi. Yeah. That's what's up. Nice. Yeah, Lou's in Brooklyn. Lou's doing some time though. Yeah. He's a good man. It's been in time since like early nineties and shit. But he got twenty five years in. Yeah, just one of the homies though. You know, so we all kind of like knew the same people. Yeah, you know, what I'm saying kind of yeah. built from the same cloth. Yeah, and you know, just cross paths all the time. Yeah, absolutely, man. And everybody going through all that, and then to find yourselves having success, and you know, like Mike, you got to deal with building success. this legend. You got to worry about, but you got to worry about protecting your legend. Well, now you have success. Yeah. Now how do you protect it? Yeah. You know what I mean? You hate to say you think you have police. Police are not going to protect you. You have to get your own um, enforcers. That's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The police are not going to protect you. Yeah. You're a taxpayer. You're not out in the street robbing and stealing no more. They can't protect you. You have to get your own enforcers now. So now that's really, that's that's step in the line of law enforcement pretty much. Yeah, that's interesting, Mike. You're talking about having bodyguards. Yo, absolutely. Your people that... Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, man. Well, listen, you think once we... God willing, we sell this company and things happen the way we anticipate them. You think we're going to leave an open door like that? Come on. Really? No, it's not. You can't you do can't, that. It's really. not. You're just a, you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. What? I had the Jags buy two last week. I need my goddamn money, dudes. That sounds like your problem, man. I don't care. Go rob a bank. Can I put some money down and win like a man? What's the matter with you? Yeah, man, huh? if I was you, I wouldn't even listen to that motherfucker, man. Go online right now. Put my bookie online. Fuck it. Yeah, tell him. Fuck, fuck him. I'm going to use my bookie online. You don't got to take that bullshit from them. Hell no. That's right. My bookie online. You play, you win, they pay. That's what I'm talking about. Done. All day, every day. Let's do it. My bookie online. Boom. <laughs> My bookie online has better bonuses and more prop bets than any other sports book, period. Sign up for a chance to receive a $1,000 bonus at my bookie online today. That's my bookie, M-Y-B-O-O-K-I-E. And don't forget to use the promo code HOTBOXING to activate the offer. It was beautiful to hear you talk about um, how you came to understanding how important fashion was, but it's something we talk about here all the time. Do you feel like there's something inside of you that inspires you on your mission through life? Like from the time you were a little kid, was there a, you know, a voice within you that, you know, was pushing you, urging you onto this path? Yeah, I think so. I felt like I always wanted to do better. And my father, he came to the United States, opened up his own business within a year. Then sent for me, my mother, and my sister. He always drove fancy cars, Cadillacs. He hung out at this little bar on Utica called Salt and Pepper. But he always wanted the best things. He left my mom's and my sister and left us in the projects when I was 12 years old, just left. Wait, wait, uh, East New York? East New York, yeah. He just left us and moved with some other woman down in Florida. And I think that was the best thing that ever happened in my life. Because with him there, I couldn't be a man. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't, grow, I couldn't grow to be who I was. He would be too controlling. You know what I'm saying? So without him there, my mother just let me do what I had to do. So I ran the streets. I did what I had to do. But the key was my mother kept me in Catholic school. Even though we lived in the project, she worked hard to keep me and my sister in Catholic school for eight years. So I was able to see things slightly different than everybody else that I grew up with. I was able to hang out with white kids, Chinese kids, Indian kids. Just saw life a little bit differently and hung out with them. So that strive to yearn to be successful came from my mom. She was a registered nurse. For 18 years, Brooklyn Jewish Hospital worked the night shift just to send me and my sister to school. So I had to make it. And she gave me a choice when I graduated from high school. She said, either you're going to go to college and get a job, you're not going to stay home. And that's what made me take the clothing thing serious and come out to L.A. and start to make this thing happen. And then in terms of business, when I look at things, I'd be like, the little things we go through in business, having to deal with another company or deal with a manufacturer, that's nothing compared to what you got to deal with in the streets. So if you can't figure this one out, Something's wrong. Something's wrong. And nothing's given to us. Every day we wake up on the same grind, every day, all day, because it's fun. Mm -hmm. 
so mental. Yeah, and that's um, absolutely. Once you once you in uh, from Brooklyn, you know, as a young kid hustling in the street, if there comes a time you come to an age and you say, I want to get out of here. Yeah. I don't want to live here no more. I don't want to raise my kids. You get conscious. You see, you see on television. You say, Wow. Black people could live places where motherfuckers, when you come out the door, they're not going to snatch your chain and put a gun in your face when, you, when you're with your wife and your kids. You know, you don't have to worry about somebody killing your kids tonight. When you hear the gunfire, is that my kid looking out the door, looking out the window? We didn't have phones back then, so you don't know if they got shot or not. You don't know. You know what's crazy, too? Like, you don't know. If you grew up in Brooklyn and you deal with this every day, you don't know it any other life but that until you move somewhere else and see a life it could be different yeah. otherwise you think that it's just your reality for everybody especially nowadays they have social media so now people can see back in the days we had none of that Yeah. You, the only thing you saw is what you saw <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. you know what can I tell you I was looking at, I look at um, I love YouTube now so on YouTube I could, I could go Brownville Hood and I could look at the hoods of Brownville and see all my neighborhoods and see and I see people having interviews about just Brownville and how disgusting it is how bad they want to move out of there and how many killings and robberies and everything and rapes and everything happened there and I'm just saying when I'm looking at these people I said this is my neighborhood I said these people are animals and this and that how they eat and the cops always fucking abusing them and fighting with them they're dropping fucking from a 20 foot story project they're throwing um, fucking stoves and refrigerators on top of cops' heads and cars and shit this is crazy you know what I'm talking yeah, about yeah. this is fucking crazy man so I'm saying to myself I'm looking at this, this my neighbor and still is a crazy I said God I want to be there so bad but I can't be there without some stupid fucking shit happen but I want to be there so bad but I said feel the energy yeah I can never do it again yeah. I have to kill a motherfucker quick Why do you want to be there, Mike? Because that's who I am. But I'm not that way anymore, but it's still who I am. And I want to understand why was I that way. Can I I want to observe that. I want to see me before, you know what I mean? Now that I'm not mean, I want to see that person. I want to be my kids. I want my kids to talk to that person. You know what I said? That's your father without a big fancy name and big fancy clothes and cars. That's your father right there. You're afraid of him? That's your father. How can you be afraid to say hi to him? And my kid's like, fuck no, I don't want to talk to him. You know, I said, man, you shouldn't be like that. That's your father. That's just how I felt to your father. Nobody wanted to talk to him either. Mm. They have no uh, no inclination. You know, there's just no way they could fathom living there, being from there. Yeah. Or people screaming and cursing at their father and their mother right in front of their face, saying bad, crazy shit to them. Or the cops beating up your mother or your father right in front of you. You can't do shit. Mm. You know, I have my kid, my son is 22, and I try to tell him stories about how we grew up. They look at us like we're yeah. fucking a clown. Yeah, it's fucking <laughs> they like, please. Later, yeah, daddy. Yeah, please. Yeah, daddy. Yeah, okay, dad. Sometimes I wish I could just drop him off in the projects for a month. Yeah, dad, you're going to yeah. throw me off the roof, dad. Okay, dad, thank you. I'm going to get thrown off the roof, dad. Yeah, dad. Somebody's going to shoot me for no reason, dad. <laughs> Just because I'm from this neighborhood, somebody's gonna shoot me because I'm from this neighbor. This neighborhood never did nothing to that neighbor. How they gonna shoot? That don't make sense, Dad. <laughs> they don't get it. It's the truth. How do you guys make sense of that? It goes like this. I don't know how cause perception is, but this is how I go from my world. I'm Browns in New York, right? This is the real, right? There's people in Brownsville, you know, you be nice to them. There's some people in Brownville, they have the biggest family and they're mean and they know that they have the biggest family and they all have different personalities. Even though some of the family members don't get along, if it's enough you get into the fight, the whole fucking building's coming out on his side. Even though they don't like him, they know he's a no good motherfucker. So we know, be nice to this family. Be nice to these. Avoid people who can crush you and try to be cool with them. Just like we live now with corporations. Don't get this corporation mad at you. Be nice with them. Don't fuck with the fucking Rockefellers. Be nice to the Rothschild. That kind of stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's the same, way in the, the same way in the hood. Be nice to this family. Be nice to these guys. Sometimes when these niggas going to take your shit, they got to give it up to them. Take a loss. It's okay. <laughs> give it up to them. It they, will, they will fuck you. I and mean, hope they start to like you. Because sometimes it's crazy. Sometimes this guy been robbing me all the time. And then somebody else is robbing me. And then he takes up for you. And he <laughs> likes you all of a sudden. This is just. He a, protects you. Listen, this is. I, you don't know how these motherfuckers think. You don't know if this guy's going to kill you today or going to kill somebody for you today. It's just crazy, man. You talking about dealing with some people who are real psychopaths. 
And they're cool with you and you hang out with them every day, but they all oh, fuck what they can do to another human being is just unfucking fathomable. Yeah. So that's where we come from. You know, like yeah. when all these guys come out of jail from doing these 25 years, these 30 years, and they're fucking mad, they send them right to our neighborhood. They don't send them no fucking, they send them, you think, we, you think we're not scared of them? We're scared of them too. We don't want them in our fucking community, but we're too afraid to tell them to get the fuck out. Mm. These guys are savage and vicious and mean people, man. It's no option. You just got to deal with it. Yeah. When you're asking us how the perception is, it's like... We know how to be nice to people. Black people know how to be real nice to people. <laughs> We've been ter terrorized a lot in our own community. We know how to be nice to people. We don't want to get fucked up. Mm. <laughs> We don't want to be fucked up. We want to get the fuck away. We don't want to go back. That's the main thing. You lose a fight. You lose your money. The first thing is, am I going to go back to Brownsville? So I got to go back and live in them fucking projects after all this major success. So I got to go back in that fucking project and open that fucking door and come out in that courtyard and see these motherfuckers. <laughs> hey, what are you back, huh? <laughs> oh, nigga. <laughs> you know, that scares me, actually. Oh, nigga. You could die of a heart attack, motherfucker. <laughs> That's a scary thought. <laughs> oh, these, mad, these motherfuckers probably ransack the fucking apartment as soon as you get in and ram. What the fuck you got? Whatever shit you wow. got, nigga. Give me your tattoos, motherfucker. They fucking skin you. You know, I'm serious, though. I'm making yeah. fun of it, but I'm getting serious. No, I, yeah, I understand. <laughs> no, I remember. I understand. Uh, I remember dudes used to rob you for your gold teeth. Oh, mm. yeah. You got a gold tooth, they'll punch that shit out your mouth. Nigga. Oh, tooth can't even fit their mouth. They're going to figure out how to fix that shit. They'll figure it out. Thing. Your sneakers, I remember them taking my sneakers a couple of Take my fucking sneakers. Shit. Straight up. And um, listen, can I tell you something? You're so fucking filled, filled with fear, you can't even, even and the thought of fighting back doesn't even pass, go through your mind. You feel like a fucking sheep in fucking hell. You're so fucking afraid, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then next thing you know, You meet, you meet, you meet a guy, right, in school or something. He's a normal guy. He's like you. He's a nice guy. But his brother's one of those guys. So now you're a cool guy. And you start hanging out with the brother. Brother see you with his brother, and they come to rob people. His brother not there, but they see you. Normally they rob you. Hey, let him go. He's my brother. Him, my brother hangs out. Then you start hanging out with you, and then you come like, become like dumb. Now you're the bully. Mm. And that's how it goes. Because you were accepted in. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Carl, I was born in New York City, too, and I yeah, lived South in Brooklyn, was, um, uh, Park, Park Slope. Slope. I went to school there for a little bit. PS 107, man. I went to John Jay. Oh, oh amazing. On 7th Ave? Yeah. Yeah. But I remember as a little kid seeing the sneakers thrown up on the electrical wires. Yeah. And that was so ominous and scary to me as a little kid, seeing that. Because I didn't know what that meant. It looked like somebody... It means somebody got a new pair of sneakers. Is that all it means? Yeah, and they threw the old ones up there. <laughs> <laughs> That used to scare me. I used to think that oh, was someone got fucking, killed. No, somebody is want to diss you and take your sneakers and throw it right. to make your, like, your day miserable. Right. Or that. That too. Yeah. Because that's just, that's, that's what it was like. It's some mean ass fucking kids. Yeah, a lot of mean kids. Mean fucking kids. Yeah. Kids are pretty fucking mean. And if you if you continue to let them push you, they actually kill you. Mm -hmm. If you let them. Lord of the Flies. Yeah. Carl, where do you think we come from? That's interesting, huh? Like whatever the very we, first... Whatever we come from... Your very from first fucking, ancestor, your most ancient yeah. ancestor, thousands and thousands of years the ago. The first man that had you in his sack. The first <laughs> man, that's your first... The first man that ever existed with your blood. With your DNA. Who do I think he is? Yeah. Or where I think he comes from? Sure, yeah. Have you ever thought about that? You know, when I grew up in Brooklyn, we, we got knowledge of self when I was like... 11 years old. My name was Naquan Barshawn, God Allah. Were you 5%er? I was a 5%er too. 5%er. Yeah. Prince Love. That's your attribute. Yeah. His name. So, so we have to study these lessons that tells you about the black man and our essence, supreme being. Interesting. And you couldn't come outside unless you knew your lessons. Oh, you get fucked you up. get fucked up. Today's equality. Yeah. And you have to explain equality. <laughs> Wow. The origin of equality. Oh, that yeah. fucking Oh, yeah. you don't know that you fucked up, man. <laughs> Tell me. Oh. This is amazing. So I remember the king is he who sits he who sits on the throne of power and rules wisely and justly. That's what king meant. 
and each date had a different mathematics, and you had to say what the date was and what it all being born to. <laughs> and that's in a circle, and everybody's saying it, and it's coming off the top of your head. And it's not as, it's not as um, short as he's explaining. It's long. It's long, it's, very long. talking long. You're there fucking talking for 30 <laughs> minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. 30 minutes, now the next guy you. turn and talk about yeah. his, his, his fucking His thing, name, And yeah. it has to be what it means and what, how it equates with today's mathematics. <laughs> oh, like, oh, that's a mind-boggling <laughs> shit. Wow. And you're a young kid and you're you know kid. it. You're a young kid. You got to know it. You got to know it. You know it. You, know it. you don't got, if that was your protect, if you see, if you're down with the, the five percent is, you could see you, 40 you, of them coming ahead of you. You, you could be, you prote you're protected. Yeah. You're protected mm. in, in all different neighborhoods of Brooklyn. You're good. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what we wanted with protecting. We yeah. didn't want to get ripped off and yeah. robbed and yeah. look be humiliated in front of our family, in front of our friends, our girlfriends. That's all people wanted in Brooklyn. Yeah. I remember my mom used to find my lessons because my mother used to go to Baptist church, had me in Catholic school, and here I am with some 5% of the nation of Islam paperwork. <laughs> she used to take it and throw them away. She used to buy the papers, throw the papers away. I used to get another copy of it. She used to, oh, I had to fuck. study it. Because yeah. you knew that it would be beneficial for you absolutely be you better know that man yeah that's real so when you ask me supreme being man, i think the supreme being is just a spirit man mm. and we're all being born from that and i do believe that we originate in africa mm. i do believe that i believe all black people originated in africa and started to descend throughout i don't the believe world. that you don't believe that mm -mm. okay i don't believe that you know why tell me so how do you think we make the different races? If, all of, if everybody that came out of Africa was black, then the world should be black. Okay. The first man. How did we? How do we? How did the color change in race? No one make the race. Our, um, our geographical location um, dictates our race. You know what I mean? So all the black people came from Africa. Everybody in Africa is dark black, right? So we go to Brazil. We go to this place. We go to Brazil. Brazil got the big tree. They, they, um, they hide the sun hip not skin. Over, over a couple of hundred years or so, your skin is not black no more. After um, a couple of hundred years. Now your hair is not curly no more because they got the big, the big, what's that big, the big tree that blocked the sun from hitting your hair. So now you know, your, your hair, get, you get the, um, the moist. What's that called? The humid comes down. You don't get no sun, so your head drops. Now people change within the man. In 200 years, um, what's his name? Alexander Dumas' family changed. Yeah. yeah. From black Haitian guy to a Jewish family, from a, from Dumas to Oppenheimer. And that's only 200 years. Now imagine the millions of years that people could, um, what's the word we talk about? We um, Evolve. Evolve, yeah. You know what I mean? I don't believe, I don't believe sometimes if, if it's from Africa, then there was no, everybody that's, if it's from Africa, we're all related then. Then everybody's related if we all come from Africa. And we couldn't all come from Africa because now research, if you look now, there's countries that are, that's built under other countries that's older than Africa. Yeah. Hmm. You know? There's countries built under Turkey that's older than Africa, 9,000, nine, what, 9,000 years old? I think more than that. Yeah, Interesting. We don't, we don't know who we are. You know, that's the fact. We don't know who we are. How much knowledge? Knowledge is infinite. And most of the knowledge that we know is lies. Yeah. We only know what we are told. We don't know anything that's definite. Only thing we know is told. And what happened during our time that we could see is truthful. We can't even see, tell who, where we came from. I can't even tell you who's the first and my first, my first bloodline. Like we were saying, who's the first guy that had my, that had my bloodline? That created me. Who is that person? What 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 age? What time was he? A million years ago? Was he two million? Was he a billion years ago? How long was he? How long was I in existence? My bloodline in existence? Did it just start in what? A hundred years ago? Two hundred years ago? Or during five hundred years during slavery? How did it come? How did it get to this country? How did it get to Africa? We don't, I, you know, we only know what people tell us. And everything we know is cryptic. Yeah, we're just indoctrinated from such a young age with this history that's really totally made up as far as we know. You know, you know the world keeps us searching. That keeps us alive because if, if I have everything, what's my purpose of living? I don't want to live anymore. If I, if I have all the money in the world, all the women in the world, all the clothes in the world, all the drinks in the world, everything that I need to, to stimulate me as a human being, why do I need to live anymore? It can't be stimulated anymore. That's all. This all I have to give. This is all. There's right. no more. Right. You sure? Yeah. There's nothing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. It's a wrap. Right. Right. 
That's I know. just what it is. It's such a dead end. Yeah. The material, all, yeah, the, the material, material dimension. This all. This all. You sure? Right. Okay. You get you married. Sure? I'm married. I have got kids. the house. I got it all. I got everything. The money. You got the, the cars. Beach. I got the country. I got the world. This is all it got for me. That's this is it. All? Boom. I'm gone. Yeah. Because that's what we do. We, we need to stimulate our mind. Because as long as we stimulate our mind, we could live. Once we stop stimulating, fuck this shit. Let's, I'm out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Carl, have you, um, you smoke some weed. Have you always had a relationship with cannabis? Uh, have to, right? I started, I used to smoke weed as a teenager. And then I stopped smoking weed when I came to California in 89. I didn't start That's ironic. Yeah. Then I started smoking weed again back in like 96 because of my cousin and my friend AZ. They used to come to my house, influence me. They used to come in and get high, and they used to be sitting there having a good old time. And then one day my cousin Tony says, Yo, Carl, why don't you try smoking some weed and watch a movie? I'm telling you, man, the movie's going to be so much different to you, man. Trust me when I tell you that. And sure enough, I smoked some weed, watched a movie, and this movie felt so good. It, it looked so good. And that feeling just like started me back again. And then it just got to, got to a point it just helped me design better. Yeah, creative. Yeah, yeah creative. Wow, well, yeah, very, very. It just helps me get in a zone like un, unimaginable and fast too. Yeah. I could do shit really fast. Yeah. So, yeah, my, makes sense. my relationship's been pretty cool lately. You know, um, I can remember, like, being a young kid. I'm trying to think, probably, what, what was it, 70, what? Probably 77, around 11 years old. And I would, um, and I used to think I was dressed really good, right? Because I used to have, um, I used to have jean suits, like, what, Lee suits? Remember Lee's back in that seven? Two-piece, raw. Lee suits, and I used to have, um, I used to wear ski suits, like I was going skiing, mm. but we didn't go ski, we just wore the suit. <laughs> you know, so I thought I, was, I thought I was dressing really good. I mean, you know, I'm a young kid, I'm 11 years old. You yeah. know, I got $200 yeah. suits, so I got $20, um, $300 worth. I, I'm really wow. good, you know. I'm really looking good. And then I go over with these guys on Rutland Road with these, um, these are mostly Caribbean people. Yeah. Mm. And stuff. And these guys are dressing like men. They're wearing fucking leather, um, um, straddle mm. coats and stuff, 600 bucks. They got alligator shoes it's on. looking I said, dope. I said, I want to be with these guys. So oh, I yeah. started hanging around with these guys. So what they were doing, their main thing was bur bur burglaries. They were breaking the house. And during that process, when we were breaking the house, and I was just a kid, we would get guns. We would get fucking money. Money. We would get jewelry. This was amazing to me. Then you take the jewelry. You were eleven. Yeah, I'm just getting, it's going ripping people out. With keys, they had keys that fit these people's <laughs> houses. And the way they did, they would take a key and it would, they would jam the lock in some way. It wasn't even a lock key to the lock. And these guys were just masters. They must have learned <laughs> this in the Caribbean where they came from or something. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Yes, and we would get M16. We would get guns. We get 45. We got. Where would you get the guns? 22. And all that's the Jewish neighborhood. In the house? Had, yeah. Oh, oh. You Under were taking the bed, in the cabinets. House. Man, you would get silverware, goldware. It was crazy. It was crazy. That's crazy. What neighborhoods would you go into? You would go to the Jewish neighborhood. You would go to the West Indian neighborhood. They, the West Indian, the Jewish. Because the West Indians were like, they always had jobs. Yeah, they did. They weren't like the regular American blacks. They weren't lazy. Mm -hmm. Like, nah, they I ain't yeah. going to work. They fucked it. No, <laughs> these Everybody in the family is out of the fucking house. <laughs> oh, oh. oh right. So you'd go during the day? Yeah, early morning when they go to work. Oh, wow. Yeah. But sometimes, um, sometimes some people don't go to work, and sometimes they're in the house while you rob and they're talking because they think you're somebody that came back from school that came to work, <laughs> and so they're talking to you. So you think they came in the house, you must have left, and I don't know, but they were talking to me, and I'm like, Somebody say something. I'm by myself. This motherfucker sat out here and shit. And so I get out the house real good. And I try to come a dumb motherfucker. I try to lock the door back like I didn't know. It was I should have just closed the door and ran. So I try to lock the back and the fucking door open. Boom! And he fucking tried. I ran. Oh, oh fuck. fuck! Oh shit! He almost got me. I said, fuck! Fuck! I fuck! Mean, and motherfuckers talk. I say, am I hearing some shit? Cause I knocked on the door and nobody said anything. I knocked on the door. I knocked hard. Nobody fucking opened the door and came to the door. And so I opened, boom, the lock. Jam. I get in, I close the door. I'm looking under the fucking shit. 
And I hear some. I didn't cut no light on it. It was dark. I stayed in the. And I hear some. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. It's you, baby? Is it okay? What the fuck? Oh, shit, somebody in here. <laughs> you understand that, baby? That's a cool story. You understand that, totally baby? That's, that's totally crazy, wow. Mike. That's funny, man. Oh, my God, wow. that's so crazy. I have friends that have been killed caught in people's Doing houses. That? That's what happens in Brooklyn. You get caught yeah. in the house, you're finished. Uh, yeah. You're finished, baby. I remember one of my friends, he was robbing the crib in Star City. His name is Shalik. Mm. And the keys that he got, it was a, the the owner. It was a sheriff. So he gets into the crib and he starts seeing all these plaques on the wall, oh. right? So anyway, so now he's nervous, but he's still gonna rob the crib. Now he's looking in there. Somebody saw him go into the unit and call security. You know, Star City had his own security. Call security on him. So security surrounded the apartment. So he's inside of the apartment. He's calling all of us. We were about like twelve years old. Yo, call security and tell them something happened in your building so they can leave and come to your building. Oh, so all my friends, we started calling them, by like, reporting shit in other oh, buildings. Shit. Of course, he thought they all left. Of course, they didn't all leave. Yeah. When, he, when he finally thought the coast was clear, he comes out. Because he had a decision to make. If the sheriff comes home and see him in the apartment, he probably could shoot his ass. So do you give? Do you stay in the apartment, or do you give yourself no, up? No, you get out. You man. get the fuck out. You get out. Don't get in the house. <laughs> yeah. Stay out the house. Yeah. Get out of the fucking house because it's almost legal for them to kill you. Yeah, get you in there. exactly. Get out. Of, get in the hallway. Get out of the house. So get the fuck out the house. He finally thought it the coast was clear. Came outside and they they got him pretty good. Fuck. Mm. Yeah, so that's pretty. Uh, that's so crazy. Classic right there. Crazy world we used to live in. Like, man, that's not what we do for clothes and money. <laughs> and that's all we did it for. Clothes. For clothes. Like right. Old teeth and shit. That's it. Nothing else. Yeah. We weren't investing in nothing. No. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. It's crazy, man. Well, the reason I brought up the cannabis stuff, too, Carl, is because that's pretty mind expanding stuff. Yeah. And Mike has had this experience with the toad. Do you know about the toad? I don't. Oh, explain it. Do you know about uh, DMT and psychedelics and ayahuasca? Have you heard of any of these things? I do not. Okay, so I know about jeep buttons, rivets, thread, you know, printing. But go ahead. That's good stuff too. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you know what you know. I know about this stuff. Uh, but DMT is a molecule. 5-MeO-DMT is a molecule that comes from the Sonoran Desert Toad. And you can vaporize this stuff, like smoke it, and you have this psychedelic experience where you experience God, you experience the oneness and the connectedness of all things, you have an ego death, so you experience your whole life in a matter of seconds, and you get downloaded with, as Mike says, thousands of years of information. That you don't even think you want. I mean, you get, you say, I don't even think I need this. Shit. I don't want to be involved with this shit. <laughs> okay. Uh, but since Mike has gone on this journey and I've been tagging along with him, you know, these, these topics come up a lot. And it's really interesting when you start to think about, you know, where we come from and why we're here, and what we're all doing here, you know? Because we're not, it's not just all trivial. It's not just all fucking for nothing, you know? We're all here for something, you know? And I think you do what you do because you're called to it from a higher power, you know? And like Mike and I doing this show, I mean, we just create this space to start having conversations that really everyone in the world needs to hear right now. And listen, you know. and excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, absolutely. And, and that's what I think sometimes when, when I say, what do you think your your purpose is here for? Do you really think that your purpose is here to, to fucking make clothes? No, somebody told you that you should make clothes. Somebody told me I should box. I never fucking wanted to, I wanted to fight motherfuckers and rob them and shit and show people I was tough in the neighborhood not to fuck with me. But the box, to be professional and be disciplined and be focused on something and the whole world is empty and only this matters. Right. Never in a million years. I couldn't imagine, imagine that. Right. You know, And but when you get older and you get more focused and you become more mature and you want to gather things in life, you want people to like you, you want people to look up to you, you want to be respected, you want to be liked, you become a different person for that. That's my goal in life, to be accepted by 
great people, the people that want to accept me and people that I want to be accepted with that, you know, they can help me in life and make me feel good about myself and all that bullshit. Because that's what it all comes down to, how we feel about ourselves. Because most people in Brooklyn and come from Browns and they, we don't like ourselves. That's why we can't stay out of prisons and stuff. You know, we believe this is our destiny because that's all we saw before us. Everybody, all our best friends, all our friends' fathers and best older brothers and older friends just going in and out of jail and being celebrated for it. Oh, he's back, nigga, back. Oh, nigga, you back. And that was brilliant. Coming back, that was it's just awesome. You came back from break. You're somebody special. You did your time. You're telling nobody you're a man. Come back. I love you. You're the man again. Mm. Yeah, we thought that was dope. Yeah. Mm. Right? That yeah. brings back. Yeah, you yeah. thought that was dope. Interesting. You know, you want to be that guy. Yeah. Hmm. But you come back home with no skills, no anything. Nothing. Just prepared to go back in that residuary system. Just come back home with respect. <laughs> That's it. You know, nobody has a job for you. They have a gun for you. They have a bag of dope for you, but they don't have a job for you. Just say, hey, this is going to be, you're going to take care of your family and wife and you don't have to look over your back. No, we, that's not happening. Normally, um, the life expectancy for guys that come out of prison and don't go back to jail is probably a year. Fuck. You just don't know how to do anything. Well, you know how to do. You, know you don't do know how to get started. Do, right, you know? right. Yeah. I mean, how do you guys. Where do you go? Listen, how do we got. Listen, for real. Somebody from the. How. how the percentage of somebody. Some fucking guy go to buy this guy's clothes. That's a famous guy. What's the percentage of somebody's gonna get me and say, "Hey, I'm in a facility, a facility anyway." How? What's the possible someone gonna say, "Hey, man, would you like to start boxing? I think you got talent. You can go somewhere." What's the What's the fucking possibility that's gonna happen, though? I know it's it's. Uh, they come from where we come. What's that possibility? It's scary. Fraction. Yeah. Percent. When yeah. I when I look at Browns, I say, it, "Was it true that I'm I really from that place?" Did I really evolve from that place? Did I? I can't believe it. You know, I said, wow, how did I make it out of there? There's guys that got caught up in that system that was a lot smarter than me. There's guys I looked up to. These guys were smarter. They, they always got away. They were always, they talked better. They had more education. Why they stayed and I got out of that situation? And it's just you don't know. That's when you say, who are we? Is it destined for this to happen? Right. Even without us caring about it? Because sometimes we get all these blessings and we're still jerks and assholes. So it's our consciousness. Our consciousness is not, why are we here? Why am I so talented even when I'm a dick? When I should fail, why am I still succeeding? Maybe it's for another purpose bigger than myself. I don't know. I'm not saying I'm somebody special, but why does that happen? When everybody else does it, they fail. There's no per You just can't succeed, and I do it, and I succeed. So you say to yourself... This is this is weird. And you don't want to look at yourself because deep down inside, you know who you are. You know your mistakes. You say, I hate myself. I'm nothing. I'm a nigga. How could I be anything? But still, great things are happening for you. So you get discouraged and you want to destroy it because, you, you know, I don't want to be this guy no more. People are saying they love me. I don't want nobody to love me. It's, you got to get adapted to that lifestyle again. You know, all my life I was hurt. I was a nothing nigga. Nothing ever happened to me. Now people say, I love you. You're the greatest. All this shit. That's, that's scary stuff. What do you think about that, Carl? I think it's real. I think that um, we all are here for a purpose. And you're right. Why me? You know, why me out of everybody that, why did I think of it first? What I think about that is I didn't think about it. Mm. It just happened. Mm. You know, it's happened in the moment. I accepted each moment that came my way. I didn't fight against the moment. Like, I didn't know I was going to do clothing. Mm -hmm. I was trying to do other shit. It just happened. Yeah. You know, it just happened. I made the outfit and somebody paid the compliments and my friends wanted to buy some. You know, I didn't plan that. That to happen. By that happening, that made me make them something. And by that girl making that comment, if she didn't make that comment that day, I could have still just been making plain clothes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. of that comment that she made made me go home and think of a name. And I started that journey. But I accepted each moment, just went with what was happening. And why did I come to a California? If AZ never caught the case and never moved to California, he would never call my house. I would have never met Cross Colors. <laughs> None of this shit would have happened. I still been probably in Brooklyn making clothing. 100%. 100%.
You know what I'm saying? By me coming here, Cross Colors had the financing behind them. They was able to finance Carl Kanai from us working in an apartment, doing maybe two, three thousand dollars a month to having a warehouse, fifty thousand square foot warehouse to finance millions of dollars worth of orders. You took a lot of risks though. You know, you took the chance of being hurt by these fucking maniacs back in the day and stuff. So you took a lot of risks. It wasn't like you didn't come and it was just like all glory days right. and stuff, you know? Right. Right. <clears throat> so it's so deep when you think about it. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? It's deep. Because it could have been anybody. I think what you said is just hit it on the head, though, man. Accepting each moment as it came to you. Yeah. I can accept this shit. No, something ain't right. Yeah. I got to do something right. fucked up and see why I go to prison or not, because this shit is just too good. Mm. You know, and I got just as much of power of tearing myself down as I give by building myself up. It's such a weird thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. so weird. It's interesting. Yeah. I think when I think about all this conversation right now, I think the slight difference that I had to some of my friends was my mother kept me in Baptist church and she kept me in Catholic school. But I still grew up in the hood. Yeah, I respect that. Do you know what I mean? So it's almost like you got two worlds and 5% nation as well. So I had a lot of different information at one time so you could see different things and look at life slightly differently than somebody else whose parents weren't at home. And my dedication to boxing kept me here because that's all I yeah. thought about. I became a fanatic because I'm one of those guys, if I get any information, somebody say, Mike, this is what we're doing now, I want to know who's the first guy that ever did it. Yeah. So I get the boxing books, I look at the first guy. I didn't even know how to act as a boxer. What the fuck a boxer act like? I had to read about great fighters and stuff and find out how they act and how they conducted themselves. Say, oh, this is how I want to be. I want to be like this guy, little this guy. I didn't know how a fucking boxer acts. I had no idea. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Well, Carl, what do you have? What's happening right now? What do you, you got kids, going Carl? right now? Do I have kids? Um, yeah, I've got two. I got uh, my son's 22. My daughter's 18. What they doing? They involved with the business? Yeah, I tell you. Well, my daughter, I'm talking about her first. She's 18 years old. She's a culinary chef. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You know what she's doing? Huh? She knows what oh, she's doing. Oh, she's, she's, she's my miniature me. She's yeah. focused from day one. She she came to me when she was in the sixth grade. She wanted to be homeschooled because she, she was going to focus on her business. And wow. she mastered sh culinary chef and self-taught. She does pop-up. She just did a, a dinner for Smokey Robinson at his house. She catered oh, the whole that's thing. That's dope. And she does a lot of that celebrity dinner. She cooked for wow. She cooked for Oprah. Oh, you know, um, Simone L. Cool J's wife is, is, is her aunt. She makes dinners for them. Um, so she's good. My son, he's 22. He just left University of Washington. He had a baseball scholarship there. Huskies. Had him, yeah, had him playing baseball in Sherman Oaks, California, all year round. Yeah. He had the talent to go to the next level, but he didn't want the grind of baseball anymore. I think mm. he got burnt out of baseball. So now he's doing computer and 3D animation and um, building websites and that world that's right cool. there. That's awesome. So that's kind of where he's at with his life. But they're two great kids. I love them to death. Um, they inspire me every day to continue to do what I do. Big time. I, th I think the same thing. Awesome, I only think I'm so happy my kids want to raise them Brownsville. Mm. I thought I said, God, my poor babies. <laughs> they have records and shit. They fucking be felons, probably. <laughs> my get shot. They may have bullets in them and shit. Mm -hmm. Slices on their face. <laughs> Fuck. You asked me what was next? Yeah, what do you got going right now, man? Yeah, so right now we're celebrating our 30th year anniversary this uh, year. 30 years, 30 years, man. 30, 30 years. years. That's amazing. 30 years of Carl Kanai, started in 89. So right now we have 10 stores in Japan, and we're distributed in 25 foreign countries. Germany, Switzerland, Amsterdam is probably bringing some of our biggest markets in Italy. So we're doing the 30th anniversary in Germany, Cologne, Germany, um, this August. So we're going to do that. And we're just here, just you know, penetrating the streets again. The 90s fashion is back, so we're back on track. It's awesome, man. I really want my own track soon. There you go. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Please. Please. I ain't fucking around. Uh, sure. I'll fucking buy it, dude. All right, no problem. This looks like what the, um, the seatbelt is made out of. Yeah, the nylon. Yeah. yeah. It's there dope you go. as hell. Rock that on the pod, dude. You know, yeah. once, 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 once foot through the day. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, thanks for coming, man. Absolutely. This was awesome. Great to get to know you now after seeing you in art. LA I'm Fitness, exactly. man. Now now we know about yeah. art and Thank shit. you. Hell yeah, art. brother. Thank you again, Thank you, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, man. Mike, uh, awesome guest. Hey, listen, another great episode of Hot Boxing, the great legendary um, seamstress, 
designer Carl Canal is here and he's leaving. There's anything you want the people to know? Yo, just check me out, Carl Canai, without a doubt. Um, 30th year anniversary coming up. Check us out on Instagram, Carl Canai, Twitter, all that, Carl Canai. Peace. Out of here. Awesome. Choo. Later. See you, bro. There you go. That was awesome. That was Man. Great, bro.